The Book of Mormon is unique. Of all the billions of books that have been published throughout history, it stands alone in several categories. First, it is the nexus, that is, the only record of several otherwise unknown civilizations that inhabited the North and South American continents prior to their discovery by Columbus. Modern archaeology having since confirmed evidence of their existence, even though these civilizations are still shrouded in mystery. Second, perhaps the book's greatest import is the manner in which its original authors chronicled and recorded God's dealings with those people. It is the Word of God. Like the Bible, it is Holy Scripture, with form and content similar to that of the Bible. The book features writings by several individuals, each of whom was chosen by God to serve as His mouthpiece, communicating His will to the earth's people, regardless of their various cultures or geographical dispersions. Whereas the Bible is a compilation of writings by Moses and those prophets who succeeded him down through centuries and generations, the Book of Mormon, too, shows the same pattern of communication from a heavenly Father, or God, to his earthly offspring. He has always striven to be the guiding influence in people's lives, wherever they may be or whenever they may have lived. The prophet Amos said, Surely the Lord God will do nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. It is the only account of those ancient American lives, and God's dealings with them, and how they disappeared. Which brings us to the fourth unique feature of this book. No other book in existence had divine involvement in its coming forth like the Book of Mormon. The young Joseph Smith, visited by a resurrected individual who introduces himself as Moroni, and tells the young Smith that he is a messenger sent from God, and that God has a special assignment for him. Little did Joseph realize the impact that visit would have on his life, and now millions of lives that have been impacted and deeply affected by what became the Book of Mormon. A resurrected being, an angelic messenger named Moroni, who happened to be the last of those ancient prophet historians, returning to the earth, and showing the young modern-day prophet Joseph Smith, where he, Moroni, had hid up the ancient records under instructions from the Savior that they might come forth in the latter days as a testimony of Christ, a companion to the Bible and the New Testament, a story of angels and gold plates and a modern-day prophet. It has always divided believers from non-believers. Those who do give ear to the Book of Mormon story have the most unique promise ever made a part of any book. Moroni closes his last comments that he had engraved on the gold plates. He had been looking forward, having been told by God that these ancient records will one day go forth to the world. He promised any and all future readers, and I quote, and when ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you that ye would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if ye shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost and by the power of the Holy Ghost ye may know the truth of all things. Before I begin the Book of Mormon itself, let me advise you that this is not an official presentation by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It is my intent that this recording is primarily for my family, immediate members, and future generations of my posterity. Should others come by it, please consider it a gift from me, unknowingly given, 
but with sincere hope that it might strengthen your own testimony of the Savior. Mel's marvelous audio recording of the Book of Mormon is available through Deseret Bookstores. A membership in their Bookshelf Plus program lets you listen free to it, as well as over 2,000 other audio books. Or you can download your own copy of Mel's audio Book of Mormon for $4.99. Speaking of testimonies, one of the greatest gifts resulting from accepting and living the gospel is an individual's testimony, divine witness from the Holy Spirit, that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, that Joseph Smith was his revelator and prophet, through whom Christ reestablished his church, that is, his kingdom once again on the earth, preparatory to the second coming of the Messiah. My beloved family members and friends to whom this recorded version may come, since my early youth, I have had and enjoyed that testimony that Moroni speaks of through the power of the Holy Ghost. But this experience of giving voice to these beautiful and moving stories, having first before recording, carefully reading even each verse and pondering on the emotions that those ancient prophets must have felt, as they spoke or wrote those words. It has made an emotional and a spiritual experience for me that I cannot put into words. I am one of those millions who have found deep and abiding comfort in the messages of those ancient American prophets. My narrating or recording this as an audiobook is my way of reaching out to future generations of my posterity and sharing my testimony with you. I pray that each of you will learn, live, and love the beautiful and simple concepts of the gospel, God's plan for our lives. It is the simple, beautiful, and loving message Jesus brought to the world. I pray that it will dwell in your hearts and be the guiding light in your lives. Remember who you are, a son or daughter of our loving Heavenly Father. No matter how many times I read the account of Christ's visit to those on the American continent after his crucifixion and resurrection in Jerusalem, I am awestruck by his love for all people. The crowning event recorded in the Book of Mormon is the personal ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ among the Nephites soon after his resurrection. It puts forth the doctrines of the gospel outlines the plan of salvation and tells men what they must do to gain peace and joy in this life and eternal salvation in the life to come. It is my prayer that I might be able to give voice to these wonderful words in a manner that will bring out the emotions of their authors and touch the hearts of my listeners even stronger than the printed word itself. I know that not only does God live, that Christ lives. He is the Savior of the world and my personal Savior and my advocate with our Heavenly Father. I have come to so appreciate and admire what Joseph Smith, as an instrument in the hands of the Lord, was able to give to the world. I was so moved one quiet, beautiful morning in 1985 when my wife Kathy and I stood in the sacred grove near Palmyra, New York, and contemplated what happened there on that spring morning in 1820. The young man, Joseph Smith, praying for insight as to what our lives are all about, and a vision opens to him. He sees and talks with the resurrected Savior, who has just been introduced by the heavenly being with him who spoke these words to Joseph. This is my beloved Son. Hear him. To me, that event renders moot any argument about the nature, the individuality, and distinctness of the divine personalities. Or, 
the calling of the first prophet of the Restoration. That event in 1820 will someday be called the world's most significant day and event, second only to the day of Christ's atonement and resurrection. It already is to me. Now a note or two about the storylines of the Book of Mormon. It has its beginning in Jerusalem, about 600 B.C., just prior to the city being captured and destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's army. One of the Israelite prophets, named Lehi, is warned by the Lord to take his family and leave the city. They depart with a few close friends into the desert, the beginning of a journey that eventually takes them to the then unknown part of the world today called the Americas. There they eventually develop into large civilizations that lasted until around 421 A.D. Like all other civilizations in history, though, it is a constant battle of evil versus good. God and the Savior are constantly pleading through the prophets for the people to follow and live the principles of His gospel and live righteous lives, pleading that the gospel is and always will be the only way to true happiness. The Book of Mormon is a sacred record of peoples in ancient America and was engraved upon several sets of metal plates. Sources from which this record was compiled include the following. The plates of Nephi, which were of two kinds, the small plates and the large plates. The smaller were more particularly devoted to spiritual matters and the ministry and teachings of the prophets, while the larger plates were occupied mostly by a secular history. From the time of Mosiah, however, the large plates also included items of major spiritual importance. The Book of Mormon comprises fifteen main parts or divisions known, with one exception, as books, each designated by the name of its principal author. In or about the year A.D. 421, Moroni, the last of the Nephite prophet historians, sealed the sacred record that had been in his keeping and hid it up unto the Lord in a hill in what became upstate New York, to be brought forth in latter days, as predicted by the voice of God through his ancient prophets. In A.D. 1823, some fourteen hundred years later, this same Moroni, then a resurrected personage, visited the prophet Joseph Smith and subsequently delivered the engraved plates to him to be translated. Next, may I share with you the young prophet's own account of his first and subsequent meetings with the resurrected Moroni. Now I'd like to read for you the official testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith of how it all began. The prophet's own words about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. On the evening of the 21st of September, 1823, I betook myself to prayer and supplication to Almighty God. While I was thus in the act of calling upon God, I discovered a light appearing in my room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air, for his feet did not touch the floor. He had on a loose robe of most exquisite whiteness. It was a whiteness beyond anything earthly I had ever seen. Nor do I believe that any earthly thing could be made to appear so exceedingly white and brilliant. His hands were naked, and his arms also a little above the wrist. So also were his feet naked, as were his legs a little above the ankles. His head and neck were also bare. Not only was his robe exceedingly white, but his whole person was glorious beyond description and his countenance truly like lightning. When I first looked upon him, I was afraid, 
but the fear soon left me. He called me by name, and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me, and that his name was Moroni, that God had a work for me to do, and that my name should be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues, or that it should be both good and evil spoken of among all people. He said there was a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent, and the source from whence they sprang. He also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it, as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants. Also that there were two stones in silver bows, and these stones fastened to a breastplate constituted what is called the Urim and Thummim, deposited with the plates, and the possession and use of these stones were what constituted seers in ancient or former times, and that God had prepared them for the purpose of translating the book. Again, he told me that when I got those plates, of which he had spoken, for the time that they should be obtained was not yet fulfilled, I should not show them to any person, neither the breastplate but the Urim and Thummim, only to those whom I should be commanded to show them. If I did, I should be destroyed. While he was conversing with me about the plates, the vision was opened to my mind that I could see the place where the plates were deposited, so clearly and distinctly that I knew the place again when I visited it. After this communication, I saw the light in the room begin to gather immediately around the person of him who had been speaking to me, and it continued to do so until the room was again left dark, except just around him, when instantly I saw, as it were, a conduit open right up into heaven, and he ascended till he entirely disappeared." and the room was left as it had been before this heavenly light had made its appearance. I lay musing on the singularity of the scene, and marveling greatly at what had been told me by this extraordinary messenger, when, in the midst of my meditation, I suddenly discovered that my room was again beginning to get lighted and in an instant, as it were, the same heavenly messenger was again by my bedside. He commenced, and again related the very same things which he had done at his first visit, without the least variation, which, having done, he informed me of great judgments which were coming upon the earth, with great desolations by famine, sword, and pestilence, and that these grievous judgments would come on the earth in this generation. Having related these things, he again ascended, as he had done before. By this time, so deep were the impressions made on my mind that sleep had fled from my eyes, and I lay overwhelmed in astonishment at what I had both seen and heard. But what was my surprise when, again, I beheld the same messenger at my bedside, and heard him rehearse or repeat over again to me the same things as before, and added a caution to me, telling me that Satan would try to tempt me in consequence of the indigent circumstances of my father's family, to get the plates for the purpose of getting rich. This he forbade me, saying that I must have no other object in view in getting the plates but to glorify God, and must not be influenced by any other motive than that of building his kingdom. Otherwise I could not get them. After this third visit, he again ascended into heaven as before, and I was again left to ponder on the strangeness of what I had just experienced, when almost immediately after the heavenly messenger had ascended from me for the third time, the cock crowed, and I found that day was approaching, so that our interviews must have occupied the whole of that night. 
I shortly after arose from my bed, and, as usual, went to the necessary labors of the day. But in attempting to work as at other times, I found my strength so exhausted as to render me entirely unable. My father, who was laboring along with me, discovered something to be wrong with me, and told me to go home. I started with the intention of going to the house, but in attempting to cross the fence out of the field where we were, my strength entirely failed me, and I fell helpless on the ground, and for a time was quite unconscious of anything. The first thing that I can recollect was a voice speaking unto me, calling me by name. I looked up and beheld the same messenger standing over my head, surrounded by light as before. He then again related unto me all that he had related to me the previous night, and commanded me to go to my father and tell him of the vision and commandments which I had received. I obeyed. I returned to my father in the field, and rehearsed the whole matter to him. He replied to me that it was of God, and told me to go and do as commanded by the messenger. Convenient to the village of Manchester, Ontario County, New York, stands a hill of considerable size, and the most elevated of any in the neighborhood. I obeyed. I went to the place where the messenger had told me the plates were deposited, and, owing to the distinctness of the vision which I had had concerning it, I knew the place the instant that I arrived there. On the west side of this hill, not far from the top, under a stone of considerable size, lay the plates deposited in a stone box. This stone was thick, and rounding in the middle on the upper side, and thinner towards the edges, so that the middle part of it was visible above the ground, but the edge all around was covered with earth. Having removed the earth, I obtained a lever which I got fixed under the edge of the stone, and with a little exertion raised it up. I looked in, and there indeed did I behold the plates, the Urim and Thummim, and the breastplate, as stated by the messenger. The box in which they lay was formed in some kind of cement. In the bottom of the box were laid two stones crossways of the box, and on these stones lay the plates and the other things with them. I made an attempt to take them out, but was forbidden by the messenger, and was again informed that the time for bringing them forth had not yet arrived, neither would it until four years from that time. But he told me that I should come to that place precisely in one year from that time, and that he would there meet with me, and that I should continue to do so until the time should come for obtaining the plates." Accordingly, as I had been commanded, I went at the end of each year, and at each time I found the same messenger there, and received instruction and intelligence from him at each of our interviews respecting what the Lord was going to do, and how and in what manner his kingdom was to be conducted in the last days. At length the time arrived for obtaining the plates the Urim and Thummim, and the breastplate. On the twenty-second day of September, 1,827, having gone as usual at the end of another year to the place where they were deposited, the same heavenly messenger delivered them up to me with this charge, that I should be responsible for them, that if I should let them go carelessly or through any neglect of mine, I should be cut off but that if I would use all my endeavors to preserve them until he, the messenger, should call for them, they should be protected. I 
I soon found out the reason why I had received such strict charges to keep them safe, and why it was that the messenger had said that when I had done what was required at my hand, he would call for them. For no sooner was it known that I had them than the most strenuous exertions were used to get them from me. Every stratagem that could be invented was resorted to for that purpose. The persecution became more bitter and severe than before, and multitudes were on the alert continually to get them from me, if possible. But by the wisdom of God they remained safe in my hands until I had accomplished by them what was required at my hand. When, according to arrangements, the messenger called for them, I delivered them up to him, and he has them in his charge until this day. The ancient record thus brought forth from the earth as the voice of a people speaking from the dust, and translated into modern speech by the gift and power of God, as attested by divine affirmation, was first published to the world in the year 1830 as the Book of Mormon. Today it is available in well over 100 languages. May I share with you a thought or two about the Prophet Joseph Slank, Moroni's prediction or prophecy, that because of Joseph's role in bringing the Book of Mormon to the world, his name would be both good and evil spoken of throughout the world certainly came to pass. Starting as soon as word got out, that he had been given access to the golden plates by Moroni, that he had them. Ridicule and even physical persecution intensified continuously throughout the remainder of his life. Being called by the Savior to be his instrument in restoring the full truths of his gospel resulted in a tragic and very premature end of the young prophet's life. In 1844, at the age of 38, he was murdered by a mob storming the jail where he was being held falsely imprisoned in Carthage, Illinois. Joseph Smith was born December 23, 1805. The first vision occurred in 1820. He was 14 years old. Three years later, in 1823, at the age of 17, the resurrected Moroni first appears to him, and began a four-year tutelage, preparing the young prophet for the task the Lord had called him to. In 1827, he begins translating the ancient records. It took but sixty-five working days for him and his scribe Oliver Cowdery to complete the translation into the English language, a book of some 531 pages. Simply amazing. Even for those who call him a fraud, who say the book is a product of his own frenzied mind, still, just to have come up with such a voluminous work, with so many names appearing for the first time ever, and to have done it in sixty-five days at the age of twenty-one defies logical argument. Publishing the Book of Mormon, though, was just the beginning. Under the direct tutelage of Christ himself, the Savior sent John the Baptist and three of his original apostles, Peter, James, and John, back to the earth to bestow upon Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery the priesthood keys, or authority direct from Christ, to restore on the earth not only all of the truths of his gospel, but his original church structure. Joseph organized it as the Church of Jesus Christ. Subsequently, he was told by revelation to add of Latter-day Saints to the church's name, designating it a continuation of Christ's original church, in latter days. From the date of the church's restoration in 1830, by the year 2015, the date of this recording, it had grown to well over 15 million living members, with established congregations in over 170 countries. Guided by a living prophet and twelve apostles, 
and a missionary force of some 80,000 young people, each serving voluntarily for a two-year period. The restoration message, heralded by the angel Moroni, is rapidly filling the earth. Over 160 LDS temples are scattered throughout the world, beacons of the restoration, each featuring a life-size statue of the resurrected Moroni atop the temple's highest point, trumpeting out the news of the restoration. LDS chapels for regular church services number in the thousands and are found throughout the world. Commentators usually say the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, nicknamed the Mormon Church, was founded by Joseph Smith. This is not accurate. The Church was founded by him whose name it bears. Joseph Smith was the mortal instrument in the resurrected Savior's hand through whom he effected the reestablishment of his Church on the earth. After Christ's death and resurrection, and the martyrdom of all of his original apostles, except John. The followers of Christ suffered widespread persecution at the hands of the Roman government for some three hundred years, before the Roman emperor Constantine decided maybe by making Christianity the state religion he might save the collapsing Roman government. A period of nearly 2,000 years was characterized by political opportunism, division, dissension, and apostasy from the doctrines Christ had taught. Councils argued and debated the basic principles of Christ's gospel, even the very nature and identities of the Godhead, to where confusion reigns supreme. The Reformation period saw Christianity divided into some 1,200 versions and more, all having some truth and all doing good. But the fullness of Christ's gospel, that is, all that he has revealed to date through his prophets, and the authority to act in his name, is found in only one place. The most unique thing about it all is the role of the Holy Ghost, unique in Christ's church from the days of his mortal ministry. In John 16:13, he promised that the third member of the Godhead will guide you into all the truth. Those who sincerely ask God with faith in Christ, if these things are not true, can and will receive their answer to their prayer. The Holy Ghost will speak to them in a way, personal revelation, that is, during which a feeling will come over them that they will never forget. Mm -hmm. 